Our presenter today is Dr. Amy Ralston. Amy earned her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Oberlin College and her PhD in fruit fly genetics from the University of Wisconsin in 2004. Dr. Ralston then pursued postdoctoral studies of mammalian stem cells, embryology, and genomics at the Hospital for Sick Children Research Institute in Toronto. After completing her postdoctoral studies in 2009, Dr. Ralston started her independent research career as a tenure track assistant professor of molecular cell and developmental biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. In 2014, Dr. Ralston was recruited to Michigan State University, where she is the James K. Billman Jr. MD endowed professor and associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. At MSU, Dr. Ralston teaches introductory biology to 250 undergraduates each year. Dr. Ralston also supervises an NIH-funded research laboratory where she supervises undergraduate, graduate student, and postdoctoral trainees in their experimental research. The goal of Dr. Ralston's research is to discover how mouse embryos make and use stem cells and apply this to treating human health problems such as infertility and birth defects. Dr. Ralston is the instructor of the NIH-funded Summer Lab course in Mouse Development, Stem Cells, and Cancer, which is held at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which has trained graduate students and postdoctoral fellows in the use of mouse models of human disease since 1982. Dr. Ralston's scholarly achievements led to her selection to receive a Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers from Barack Obama in 2016. Welcome, Amy. Thanks everyone for this opportunity to talk to you about my research. It's really a pleasure to address this crowd. I don't often get the opportunity to talk to such di people from such diverse educational backgrounds. So I'm really pretty excited to tell you about the work that's going on in my lab. What you're looking at here is a picture of a mouse embryo, very, very, very early in development before it has a head. And this is also what human embryos look like at this stage of development, which is before the mother even knows that she's pregnant. And this is why we like to use mice to study problems in human health, because their development and their stem cells are very similar to humans but we can, we can use mice in ways that we wouldn't use humans. So what you can see there, the cluster of yellow-green cells are the progenitors of embryonic stem cells, which many of you, is a term many of you are probably familiar with. So my lab is interested in where do those stem cells come from? How, can, how does the mouse embryo know how to use them? Because we believe that if we can understand that, then we can make better stem cells for humans and treat human diseases. Here's a cartoon representation of the embryo we were just looking at. And you can see that at that stage, those yellow cells in the middle are the progenitors of embryonic stem cells. And there are many different kinds of stem cells that, in, that are known, but embryonic stem cells have the unique property of being pluripotent, which means they can make any part of, in this case, the mouse itself. So you can see I've color-coded the three cell types that are present in the early embryo and what they will become later in gestation. The whole fetus, or the little blue cap at the top is the placenta, and then the red shell surrounding it is the yolk sac. And humans have these structures as well. And so you, what you can appreciate is that on day four of mouse development, four days after fertilization, the mouse has already created those two extra embryonic cell types, the placenta and the yolk sac. It does this before it bothers making a head because the embryo has to implant itself in the mother. In an animals that develop outside of the mother, such as frogs or flies, they start making the head right away. But mammals have a different first priority. Their priority is to say, Let's, get, let's implant into the mother's uterus, let's make a placenta, and let's, let's commence development. So that is why these stem cells in the middle, these stem cell progenitors are pluripotent because they can make any part of the fetus, but they are not totipotent because they have lost the ability to make placenta or yolk sac, two other very important structures. So there are ways to make Embryonic stem cells are typically derived from an embryo, but more recently, this really staggeringly amazing technology was invented 10 years ago by Shinya Yamanaka. It's a process called reprogramming, and it works in humans as well as mice. 
It's a, it's a process of starting with any mature cell from your body, introducing some special molecules, and then a small fraction of the cells that take up those molecules become basically indistinguishable from embryonic stem cells. So this is really a revolutionary new stem cell technology. It was recognized by the Nobel Prize in 2012. And there are a few reasons I want to emphasize why this is so cool. To me, it's cool that you can reverse development, but that's sort of an academic interest. The, in practical terms, this is great because we now have a way to make stem cells from individual people so that without using embryos. We can derive stem cells from each of you, and they would be a perfect genetic and immune match to your body. They would be the perfect therapy to replace any damaged nerves or organs that you might have. So this is really a remarkable, revolutionary new technology, but well, the reason we're, we still need to study it is because of these numbers I've listed here. We can derive an embryonic stem cell line from every single mouse embryo that we start with, 100% efficient. The efficiency of reprogramming is substantially lower for reasons we don't understand. And even more scary is the fact that it has been noted that these other cell types are produced that are not embryonic stem cells. They are neither the stem cells nor are they the cell from which uh, from which we the starting cell type. They are thought to be a cell type that is stuck in an intermediate state between being a mature cell and being a stem cell. And they have some cancer-like properties, which is not good. So if, if, if we can't fix this whole, improve this whole process, optimize, then we're really not ready to start using this technology with humans. So my lab's perspective has been, well, if mouse embryos do this so perfectly, why don't we figure out what the mouse embryo does that we're not doing? So we've taken a very hard look at the genes and the molecules that the mouse embryo uses to make these, cell, these special cell types. We've used mouse genetics to query the role of individual components in this process. And I want to tell you briefly the surprise that we learned. I'm going to skip ahead up here. One thing that, that I want to first give you a little bit of background on is that I, I already told you that ES cells are derived from the blastocyst at this stage. And I told you about this extra important extra embryonic tissue called the yolk sac. But one new thing I want to introduce is that it's been known for some time that you can also derive a special kind of stem cell from this red, these red cell types. And here they are right here. And these red cell types are also stem cells and they can go on to become any part of this yolk sac. It's an important structure in fetal development. It's known to be responsible for preventing certain kinds of birth defects. So it does more than just surround the fetus. We, we call this Zen, which stands for extra embryonic endoderm. We'll just call it Zen for the rest of this talk. So there's two stem cell types in there, not just one. So in the process of trying to understand how to improve reprogramming, our work, the work in my lab led to the following question. If the embryo uses those special molecule stem cell genes to make two kinds of stem cells, which we had shown, does, it, does this a process also affect reprogramming? Do those stem cell genes also turn some of the mature cells into an induced Zen cell? In which case, we could think differently about the mistakes that are made during reprogramming. Maybe they're not mistakes at all. But in fact, perhaps reprogramming produces two distinct cell types. And this would be really useful, because then we would have a way to study this new kind of stem cell and to create those from human cells without using human embryos. So our, this was our hypothesis. And it was correct. It, it ended up being correct. So here's, I'm just going to show you a very few pieces of data. This was first the experimental design. We started with a mature type of cell derived from the mouse's skin, from, the, from their ear, introduced the special stem cell genes, and then we waited the requisite period of time until we could see the stem cells there. We can recognize them by the shape of that cluster, and we can use a lot of other diagnostic tools to know what we're looking at as well. Most of the time, 
because reprogramming is very inefficient, only 0.1% of all those cells that you started with ended up becoming stem cells. The rest are still what they started as. But we saw these clusters here, which everybody had told us, no, those are the mistakes, stay away from those. Those are cancer, you don't want those. But we hypothesized maybe those are the other kind of stem cell. And we know enough about those stem cells in, from the mouse embryo that we knew exactly what to look for. And I'll just show you a, a few examples. For one thing, we know what shape those cells are supposed to be. This is the shape of a, of a pluripotent stem cell. They grow in these clusters. This is a group of about 100 cells, several groups of about 100 cells. They grow in a big lump, a little dome called a colony. By contrast, the Zen cells that are derived from the embryo have a very different appearance. These are little individual cells, and they have a kind of a characteristic shape to us, to our eye. And these, these are the cells that we, that we thought were the eye Zen cells on the previous slide, these. So you can, what you might be able to appreciate is that the morphology, the shape of these cells is very much more similar to Zen cells from the embryo than to a pluripotent stem cell type. So this was our first clue that our hypothesis was correct. This alone would not prove that, that our hypothesis would, was correct. This alone does not prove that these cells are not, do not have cancerous properties. So we had to do a lot more work we had to do work that we couldn't do at University of California, Santa Cruz. We had to move the lab to Michigan State University to take advantage of fantastic colleagues in the reproductive and developmental sciences program here. We collaborated with those people to prove, the, to, sh to do the, re the rest of the data, which I would love to talk to you about, maybe later. <laughs> and we had, to, we had to move the lab here so that we could use the fantastic core facilities the RTSF core facilities, genome sequencing, microscopy, and many others that we rely very heavily on. They're very well supported here, and the mouse facilities. So we could, we could actually finish this project, take the research to the next level of completion, and do and complete our dream, which was to prove that, <clears throat> indeed, the two different kinds of stem cell that are produced by the mouse embryo are also produced during reprogramming. So the take home message is, today are that I don't believe that, these, that this other side population of cells that are, are pr known to be produced during mouse and human reprogramming, I don't believe they are a mistake. I believe that they might actually be a different stem cell type and that they could be very useful to us. Uh, and the reason for that is because I mentioned that this lineage plays a really important role in mitigating birth defects. And we have no way to study that in humans. We don't have a human Zen cell. It's never been made. But now we could make them. We could make them from patients, people who's, who have had uh, given birth to children with birth defects. We could use them to study Zika virus infection. Because if the virus, Zika virus is going get, to get inside, uh, is going to try to penetrate and, and damage the fetal brain, well, it might just start with the, the extra embryonic endoderm layer. So we could study all of that, and that's what we're, that's, this is the direction we're moving in next. I want to acknowledge <coughs> my undergraduate researchers. These seven are currently helping us with various projects in the lab. And in addition, I have several very excellent postdocs and graduate students. I've mentioned the collaborators and facilities here at MSU and I'm also very grateful to my funding. Thank you all so much for your attention. Questions or questions, comments? So, so I wanna, I wanna put you on the spot for a moment. And um, so you and I are talking five years from now. Uh, what, for the people of Michigan, for the people of the world, what's the power of this to, 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 to improve health. How do you how do you think about that? I know that drives you every day. It's not it's not absolutely a passion for the the mechanics of the science. It's a passion for the way it will uh, it positively affect human beings. So Zika would be a good example of if that cell is a if we, if, if in fact you could create a better protection uh, on the on the on the wall of the of the yolk sac 
through this technology, you could prevent the Zika bad things from seeping in uh, to affect development. As an, if I got my that's right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So Zika is is really. Uh, pretty important aspect. And, you know, there are two, Zika is transmitted through the blood, so it can access the fetus through an infected mother's blood, but it's also sexually transmitted, which means that it could access the embryo and infect the embryo during conception or slightly after. Um, so it's, it's a problem. In addition, um, one of the more widely appreciated consequences of Zika fetal infection is microcephaly. I think we've all seen really heart, the heartbreaking images. And the mechanism there is not known. Most researchers are focusing on how Zika infects neural <coughs> tissues because that's an obvious place to start. Zika is a problem that needs uh, to be solved by people who understand embryogenesis. And those people say, well, if there's a smaller head, clearly the virus is causing the cells of the head to die. But the really, really exciting thing, the reason that this is such an opportunity for me, is that that red layer, one of its roles very early in development is to tell the embryo where to put the head. Do you remember I said there's no head at the very beginning? When does the head come about and how? Well, what's known is that those red cells say, you're going to be the head. And if you kill those red cells, you end up with microcephaly. So this might, not, might be more than just a, a route of infection, these Zen cells, it might actually be causal in, in the, the in resulting microcephaly phenotype. So, and like I said, we have absolutely no way to study this in humans. This occurs at stages that are so early, we can't access them, not even with imaging. So we need animal models and we need stem cell models so that we can study the interactions between virus, antibodies, vaccines, and cells. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.